Welcome, everybody. Absolutely wonderful to see you all. I'd like to firstly acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. It is a delight to welcome you here to our fabulous Melbourne Town Hall. I'm Beverly O'Connor from the ABC's News Channel, and uh, it is really a privilege and honor to be with our wonderful guest speakers here tonight, and all of you for this incredibly important conversation, the politics of mental health. The event is brought to you by Origin, well known to you all for being at the forefront of mental health in young people, and the University of New South Wales' Centre for Ideas, which prides itself on the presentation of a very thought-provoking program of events throughout the, the year with some of the world's leading thinkers. Just to let you know, this event is going to be filmed and photographed for later distribution, critically, if any of you at any point find this conversation distressing or difficult, please make sure you reach out to your support or you can contact Lifeline on 131114. It won't surprise you to know that I'm going to invoke an ABC program that I hope many of you watch Q&A on a Monday night. And last night, one of the people in the audience brought into searing focus the issue that we are going to talk about tonight. An impassioned audience member, Chrissy Grant, her brother committed suicide after years of struggling with mental health problems. And in part, she spoke for well over two minutes, with said Q and A's is being given a lot of uh, time. She said this, I'm disgusted at the lack of support I'm disgusted at the lack of facilities, all the money going to other agendas except for saving our lives. I am just sick of mental health being bottom of the barrel. The World Health Organization estimates that depression will overtake heart disease as the leading disease burden by 2030, yet it still only receives 2% of the global healthcare budget. Why? That is the question we want to grapple with tonight. How do we cut through? Is it ignorance, prejudice, stigma that keeps mental health often hidden, neglected, and down the chain of budgetary priorities? As you well know by now, we have a star-studded lineup to debate this a little later. Mental health champion, Professor Patrick McGorry, a man never far from the headlines, Christopher Pine, and political campaign strategist, Dee Madigan. They will join our very special guest and first speaker, Alistair Campbell. Alistair really has a unique insight into the worlds of both politics and mental health. You'll know him best for his role as the former British Prime Minister, Tony Blair's spokesperson, press secretary and director of communications and strategy. And he continues to this day to be active in politics and campaigns in Britain and around the world. He has also very publicly documented his own battle with depression in a personal memoir on depression and the pursuit of happiness. In 2008, he featured in an award-winning BBC documentary called Cracking Up on BBC Two, which documented his own breakdown in 1986. And among other roles, he uh, wrote his first novel, All in the Mind, which led to his appointment as Mind Champion of the Year in 2009. Without further ado, please make very welcome Alistair Campbell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. And thank you, Australia, for having me here in this country at a time when mine is losing its marbles and is about to appoint a complete charlatan as Prime Minister. But hey, we'll forget about him while we're here. I also want to, I want to involve you, if I may, in a, a little self-indulgence. I have a daughter called Grace who is a comedian and feminist activist, and most of her comedy is at my expense. And when I told her the other day I was 
coming to Melbourne to do a speech about mental health, she said, Dad, nobody knows who you are in Australia. Dad, nobody will turn up. So I just want you, when I've counted three, <laughs> when I count three, I want you, here we go, when I count three, I want you to say, Gracie, Australia loves your dad. You ready? <laughs> right. One, two, three. Gracie, dad. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. <coughs> so that'll show her. <coughs> She's got a gig tonight. Apparently she sold 38 tickets, so it's good. <coughs> um, I also, by the way, I should start in this, one of the capitals of world sport, Melbourne. I should start by commiserating about the cricket and about the netball, okay? I actually, I wrote a book a few years ago called Winners and How They Succeed, and I may have to rewrite it because chapter 17 is entitled Australia's Winning Mindset. So we might, <laughs> we might have to take a look. Now... We're going to talk about mental health, um, but I want to start by talking about another issue, and that's gay rights. The reason I want to start with that is because I sometimes think that the best film ever made about campaigning was a film called Milk. And I don't know if any of you have seen Milk. Who's seen Milk? Lots of you. Good. So Milk was about a guy called Harvey Milk who was a gay rights campaigner. And at the start of the film, he's beaten up on the streets of San Francisco because that is what happened to gay men when they were openly gay back in the day. And the film ends, a couple of hours later, over here, with Milk being an elected politician and Congress having just delivered the first round of gay rights legislation. And the reason why it's such a great film about campaigning and why it reminded me of a lot of the campaigns that I've been involved in down the years, is that along that arc, you cannot tell where the change came. Why did it go from that to that? Because the legislation changing, that isn't the change. That's a consequence of the change. And then it's part of the change, and then it moves on. And so this world, mental health, I think we have to think of it in those terms. It's a campaign. It's a campaign about stigma, it's a campaign about awareness, and it's above all a campaign about services. And so we, we're in that campaign. You, by being here tonight, are part of that campaign. And that is how we have to think about it. My, the one person I've ever met in my life, who every time I met him, the hairs on my neck stood up, was Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela, said the best thing I've ever heard about campaigning. He said, everything is impossible until we make it happen. And I think that th this is one of the last great campaigns. Gay rights, it has moved in the right direction. Women's equality has moved in the right direction, has to keep going in that direction. Ethnic minorities have to keep campaigning, but there's been progress. And so on this, I actually think it's one of the last great stigmas that still exists, and we've got to break it down. The other story I want to tell you about campaigning is about smoking, tobacco. We're in a room here. Down the years, there'll have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different meetings in here, and not that long ago, historically, I could be up here talking, and you could be in the audience, and we could both be having a cigarette. Now, even if we smoke, None of us thinks about smoking, because you can't. That was a campaign, the anti-tobacco campaign against massive vested interests. They won. But the really important thing in this story for me is that a little country next to mine, Ireland, led the way. Ireland. Tony Blair, my old boss, he was quite a bold politician. He liked doing big, bold things. But even he, although he wanted to do the legislation on tobacco and banning smoking in public places, he knew the Irish were doing it, and he said, 
why don't we just wait and see how it goes in Ireland? And we did, and it went fine, and then we did it, and now it's, it's around the world. So the reason I say that to you <clears throat> is that one of the things I've been saying, I met your premier today, Dan Andrews, talk about his royal commission, and I said to him, what about if you had a situation where Victoria became the state that really led the way on delivering a proper mental health service, and then that led to Australia really becoming the country that changed the way that mental health services were, were, were done, and changed the way that we think about mental health and mental well-being, and that then led to that kind of change. So that's what I say about you think about this as a campaign. Now at the moment, I don't think any country in the world gets this right. And you, that can be countries like ours, the UK and Australia, where we get a lot right. You've got your headspace, you've got Beyond Blue do lots of good stuff, you've got lots of good campaigns, you've got great services. I've been at Origins offices today and I've got to tell you it's one of the best facilities I've ever seen. Got nothing like it in the UK. Then you've got other places like I went to Ghana last year and I saw a hospital there that was positively medieval. It was, it was one of the most horrific things I've ever seen in my life. So we're all, no country's getting it right. So what would it look like in a country that did get it right? And the first thing I'd say is that it would be a mental health service, as opposed to what we have now, which is a mental crisis service, where people only really get into contact with the service and the system if they get to that crisis point, unless maybe they've got lots of money, which is in which case you can take care of yourself. And we use in the campaign, in the UK we use this campaign message, one in four of us will have a mental health problem at any point in over a year. And I've been trying to persuade the campaign that I'm involved with, Time to Change, which is a bit, a kind of bit like Beyond Blue, but not quite the same. I've been trying to persuade them to move from one to four to one in one of us has mental health. We've all got physical health, we've all got mental health. They're, part, they're two sides of the same coin. And yet we have this idea, governments, my government for example, in the, in the National Health Service Constitution, it says that there should be parity between physical and mental health. Well, there isn't. There just isn't. And one of the things that I get really fed up with is the fact that the words on this are so easy. Mental health's a priority. Zero suicide is a goal. It's a great goal, but have a plan and show how that plan's gonna get driven through. And of course, the stigma is real and it's important and it's a challenge. And every time, particularly in the UK, by the way, there are some seats over here, people, if you want to, the ones at the back. Every time that I do an event in the UK and in different parts of the world, and you go around and you talk to, you're with ministers from different parts of the world, and they'll all say, isn't it fantastic? They'll introduce me as a speaker by saying, and isn't it fantastic that we're all speaking about mental health like this? And I'll go up and I'll say, thank you for the introduction, but I've got to tell you, Mr. Hunt, I've got to tell you, whoever your health minister might be, I am sick to death of talking about this. I'm sick to death of campaigning about it. I'm sick to death of saying the same things again and again and again and again because we're not making progress in the way that we should be. So the stigma is real and we've got to fight it. But we do need that political leadership. And you probably know that there is quite a lot going on in the politics of the United Kingdom at the moment. And I was thinking on the way down here today that there was David Cameron three years ago as he resigned, having lost the referendum on Brexit, leaving office and probably saying to himself, do you know what, I'm probably going to go down in history as the worst prime minister of modern times. And now, just three years later, he's only the third worst prime minister. <laughs> because you've got Theresa May, and now you're going to have Boris Johnson. I promise the world he is going to be really bad as Prime Minister, because I've known him for a long, long time. But let me tell you a story about another guy you may have heard of, Jeremy Hunt, who's the guy who 
is about to be announced has lost the leadership election to Boris Johnson. When he was health secretary, <clears throat> he called me in for a meeting in his office. I'd written a book about a teenage alcoholic, a novel, about self-harm. And he'd, somebody had obviously said to him, I've written this book, maybe you should have a chat to him. He does a lot of mental health policy. I went in to talk to him. I saw the book sitting on, the, on his desk. I saw that he'd even gone to the trouble of putting the flap halfway through so it looked like he was reading it. <coughs> this absolutely beautiful, pristine cover. And we sat down and we had a chat. And then at the end of the chat, he did what Christopher Pine will know this thing well, where you say to these civil servants, OK, just leave us now. Just the two of us are going to have a little chat. And they toddle off out. And then he said to me, he said, you know what? I, was, I didn't want to raise this in front of the other guys, but I was watching this documentary, the documentary that, that Bev mentioned, the cracking up. I was watching this documentary about you and about your depression. And I said to my, I said to my wife, I don't understand why Alistair Campbell would have depression. He has such a good life. And I thought, oh my God. It is one thing for Joe Public out there who doesn't necessarily have much of an education and know much that, about this stuff to say that, but for the health secretary sort of to say that depression is a lifestyle choice. And I said to him, <coughs> Jeremy, if I suddenly got my inhaler out and whacked a bit of Ventolin down, would you say, oh my God, I don't understand why you would be asthmatic. You have such a good life. <laughs> if I was wobbling around on crutches, gosh, that's weird that you've broken your leg, Alistair. You have such a good life. And yet, and he was the health secretary. And then Theresa May, the only time I have ever tweeted favorably about a conservative prime minister was the day she became prime minister. She stood outside number 10 and she said, I'm going to hit, I'm, in my premiership, I'm going to address the burning injustices of our time, and chief among them, mental health, that is my priority. She's done nothing. She's, fair enough, she's had a rough pack of cards to play with. It's not been easy. But don't say it's a priority when it's not. Priority, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means more important than the others. It's not. And then David Cameron, he, <coughs> a few years ago, if you switched on the BBC News, <coughs> the lead story was David Cameron today became the first prime minister in British history to make a speech purely devoted to mental health. Great. He made a speech. It had about 4,000 words in it. They all came together in nice sentences. And he had a pledge. And his pledge was, if you have psychosis... We will guarantee that you will see, get specialist treatment within two weeks. But wow, I've had psychosis and I've been, I rank my brains when they talk about parity between physical and mental health. If there was parity between physical and mental health, psychosis is the equivalent physically of driving a car at 100 miles an hour without your seatbelt on, going through the windscreen, landing on the motorway, and bouncing down and breaking about every bone in your body. And imagine if that was the case, and you're lying there in the gutter, and all the cars are driving by, and you're getting all the splash coming on you, and an ambulance comes by and stops that. We'll come and get you in two weeks, mate. You'll be all right. They don't get it. They don't get it. So they'll do the words. Now, actually, I think here... You've been lucky. Last night on Q&A that, that Bev mentioned, she's right. It was an amazing. I, was, I, I knew that Tony, the presenter, was going to come to me next, and I was honestly really struggling to hold back tears because it was so powerful, and you could hear a pin drop. And do you know what? I think there were two reasons why it was so powerful. One was her story, but two was I think everybody in that room last night knew somebody, knew somebody that had gone through that same thing. Because we all do, we all know somebody who has had real trouble with their mental health and hasn't had the services and hasn't had the support. So Jeff Gallup was on the panel. And of course, Jeff, Jeff, I don't know if you know this, but he goes way back with me because he was one of Tony Blair's best friends at university. And Jeff went on to be Premier of Western Australia and he resigned because of his depression. 
He felt he couldn't do the job because he was spending so much time really, really struggling with his mental health, his depression, and his anxiety. And I told him the story of a Norwegian prime minister by the name of Kjell Manja Bondevik. And if you look him up, he's a really interesting character within the mental health debate because he had chronic depression and he went to his cabinet one day and he said, I can't do the job anymore, I'm going to resign. And the cabinet rebelled against him and forced him to stay, provided he took time off to go and get well. And do you know what happened while he was off for weeks on sick, sick leave? He had the most positive poll ratings of any prime minister in Europe. There's a lesson there, Chris. There's a lesson. <clears throat> Stay out and your popularity goes up. But the thing about stigma that's really interesting, you can beat it. If I think about, we drove past today that amazing, is it McCullum? The cancer center? Incredible. I thought, wow, that's a building. That's got a lot of money in it. Stigma used to apply to cancer. It was called the big C. We didn't want to say the word, so we called it the big C. And I remember when my, I was about seven or eight, and my mum sat me and my two brothers and my sister around the kitchen table, and she said, there's something I need to tell you. Mr. Whitaker next door, he's got cancer. You mustn't tell anybody. Why? Because that's what it was like then. And that stigma has gone. And as a result of that stigma going, Governments don't dare cut the budgets on cancer, but they do dare cut the budgets on mental health. That building, Origins building is amazing, right? But I was with Pat McGorry coming down the car, and he said, actually, what we've got is like a mini version of that. But it's mini because that's where the big bucks still go. So that stigma going has had a positive impact upon the way that cancer is perceived, and that has had a positive impact on the way that services are run. And just to sort of tell you why I, why I do campaign on this, <clears throat> partly because I think it's sort of, you know, when you leave a job as I did in 2003, and you've got a whole, you know, rest of your life to think about as what you're gonna do as a now unemployed antichrist, You've got to sort of, you know, I thought, what am I going to do? And I thought one of the things that suit my skill set was campaigning around something that matters to me. And why this matters, yes, my own experience that, you know, and this, the film um, about my depression, it's actually coming out on SBS later this year. And that's a big part of it. Obviously, my, my psychosis and the depression that I've had, that's one of the reasons. But the real reason that I got involved in this in the first place, because I had a brother, Donald, who, when he was 21 in the, in the Scots Guards, <clears throat> he was invalided out of the army because he had schizophrenia. And I've got to be honest, we didn't know what schizophrenia was. But I remember it was probably, if I had to say, what are the kind of five most life-changing moments of, you know, that you that kind of, if you're only allowed to remember five things that happened in your life, what would they be? One of them would be the time that I first saw him when we went down to the military hospital and saw him there, and it was like a different human being. Now the thing is, if you say schizophrenia to people, what do they think? They think split personality. They think Jekyll and Hyde. If they're writing tabloid newspaper headlines, they only think about it when somebody kills somebody because Jesus told them to, and they'd have a nice psycho killer on the loose headline. But actually, even my brother, who, yes, he died too young because of the impact of the antipsychotic drugs, and he took them for 40 years, and he died 20 years younger than my dad, who was 82. Donald died at 62, and that's the average for people with schizophrenia taking antipsychotics over a long period of time. But he actually had, within that horrible restriction of what he called this shitty illness, he had a good life. He had a really good life because he had support. He had good doctors. He had family support. He did have a marriage for a time, but it didn't last very long. And, but the thing that he really had that gave him a sense of, I've got something to live for, he had a job. And he had an employer 
that never defined him by his illness. It defined him by who he was as a human being. He was a very good musician. He was a bagpipe player. And he was Glasgow University's official piper, played all the functions, the graduations, and all that stuff. He did the same job for 27 years with an illness like that. And he only gave it up when the drugs meant that his lung capacity eventually started to fail him and he couldn't actually even blow the pipes. So I always think, every time I go to Glasgow, I, I, I always visit, there's a painting of him on the wall. He'd have loved that. There's a painting of him on the wall in his full regalia coming down the stairs after a graduation. And I always go there and I always look at it and I always go and find somebody from the university to thank them because they were amazing. And I had a lot of luck like that as well because I was, when I had my breakdown, and we all need luck in life, and when we were coming in from the airport today, I always do this when I go, I kind of count the people who, live, who are on the streets, beggars or people, rough sleepers or whatever it be, and London at the moment is just, it's horrific, it's utterly horrific, there are hundreds of them. And I saw about four coming in from the airport, and every time I see them, I'm not religious, I don't do God, but I always do a little bit of there but for the grace of God. Because when I had my breakdown, it was in a public place. I had a psychotic attack in a public building. I was hearing voices, I was hearing music. Everybody that walked by me, I thought they were threatening me, thought they were going to kill me, thought they were talking about me. I was really starting to behave oddly. I was emptying my pockets. I was throwing things on the floor. And eventually these two guys walked towards me. I'll never forget this, because this was another life-changing moment. These two guys walked towards me, very well dressed, about my height, and I probably should have worked out they were plain clothes policemen. And the first one said to me, he said, are you okay? And I said, I don't think I am. It's the first time I'd ever, ever admitted that I was anything other than the Superman I thought myself to be, as I was careering around not eating, not sleeping, drinking too much, working too hard, not looking after relationships, not looking after my health. And my mind had exploded. And the other guy with him said, do you think we sh you should come with us? And an hour later, I was in a police cell. Three hours later, I was in hospital. And it was a turning point. And then the next big turning point was a phone call I got from my old boss, the one that I had upset by leaving to go to a different job. And he said to me, don't darken my door again. He was the first person, apart from my family, to phone. And he said, I hear you've gone mad. I said, well, I'm not very well. He said, well, look, I'm not, saying, I'm not going to say, I told you so, which is a very unsubtle way of saying, I told you so. But here's what you're going to do. You're going to stay in hospital until the doctors tell you you're fit to go. You're going to go back to that stupid newspaper I told you not to go to. You're going to stay there until you're 100%. You're going to take their money for as long as you can, and then you're going to come back here. And you're going to start at the bottom again, because that's what you need to do. And even telling you that story now, I can feel a kind of weight coming off my shoulders, because that's what he did. So that was luck. That was luck and friendship and loyalty and support, and that's what you need. You need that sense of people. But people, he was not, like Glasgow University with my brother, he was not going to define me by the fact that I'd had an episode of mental illness. But so many people do. And then when I went, I then rebuilt myself, I became a political editor, commentator, and then Tony Blair became leader of the Labour Party, he asked me to work for him. And now, because we are very, very close, and I mean, I spoke to him yesterday, and we still kind of work together on different projects at the moment, trying to get a second referendum and stop this utter madness of Brexit, people think, well, it must have been, you know, like that the whole time. I actually said no about 15 times. And one of the reasons I said no was I was worried. I've cracked up once before. This would put me under massive pressure. I'll crack up again. So I told him about my worries. And he said, well, look, I'm not worried if you're not worried. And I said, well, what if I'm worried? <laughs> and he said, I'm still not worried. And again, that was a signal. That was a guy who was leader of the Labour Party, probably going to become prime minister, saying to me, I'm not defining you by that either. 
So how do we, how do you make change in this sort of landscape? And I think with this, there, there is a political, we're all political. We're all living in a political environment all the time. And politics at the moment is difficult. Trump, Brexit, it's difficult. But I think with this issue, I, I really do think it's time has come. It's time is now. And there are arguments right across the spectrum here. If you're like me, and I guess quite a lot of the people here who might have come to see me for the politics bit rather than the mental health bit, you know, we're really, really good people. We care about the world. We've got really deep values. So looking after the most vulnerable, that's a good thing for the left to want to do. And if you're something like Christopher Pine and you're on the right of politics, and you don't really care about people, but you're really into money and stuff, and, you know, it's all about the economy, right? You've got to win the argument. He knows I'm pulling his leg, because actually he's done an amazing job in headspace. The stuff that he and Pat have done has been brilliant. But for the right, there's an economic argument, because if we can invest in mental health of young people, then we stop all of the stuff that happens later. There'll be less of it. When I saw that riot in the juvenile prison, yeah, detention centre yesterday, how many people in there will be mentally ill? Loads of them. Why? Because of the lives they've led, because of the stuff that they've got into, and then they're trapped in that system, they never get out again. How much does a suicide cost? That woman on the television last night, how much does that cost? Never mind the emotional cost. How much does it cost all of us when stuff like that happens, when the ultimate in mental illness happens in the form of somebody taking their own life? So it's the right thing to do, it improves lives, and in the long term, it's going to help the economy. That's why I thought we met the Productivity Commission today. It's brilliant the Productivity Commission is looking at mental health as an issue. And I think a country that really goes for this as its big thing, and I really, really, really hope that Scott Morrison means it, because if he means it, it really will be a worthwhile thing to do. Now... I just want to show you a picture. And those of a sensitive disposition, please don't think that it is what it, to some of you, if you have a slightly dirty mind, it might look like. <coughs> so, that is a jam jar. Why, why have I put a jam jar on the screen? Because when I made the documentary about depression recently, I met a woman in Canada, she's a genetics specialist, and she said to me, your life, Alistair, is a jam jar. And what you have to understand is at the bottom of the jam jar, we all of us have a little bit of sediment. And there's nothing that we can do about what that sediment is because that's our genes. That's our mum and our dad and our grandparents and their lives and our ancestors, that's them. And the rest of the jam jar, you fill that up with your life. And you have, you have good things and you have bad things. And sometimes the bad just gets too much. And up it goes and it gets really, really full. And then it explodes. And in the explosion, illness. Think of it like that, she said. And she said, we spend all our time trying to undo what's in the jam jar. Down this bit. The psychiatrist will say to you, you know, have you ever had inappropriate thoughts towards your mother? In this bit, in this bit, they'll say to you, what did you do today and how did that make you feel? And we'll therapize our way through all this stuff. She says, it's the wrong way to think of it. You can't shrink the jam jar, you can only extend the jam jar. And what she meant was, think about what we can do for ourselves as well. So what I've got up there, excuse my handwriting, on the right, it says FFF, that is not a kind of Malcolm Tucker shorthand, it's Fiona, my partner, family, friends. Get that right, get your relationships right, it's a good start. MA is meaningful activity. Dots, the dots are meaningful activity paid, we've all got to live, but meaningful activity also that makes you, that motivates you to do stuff. Then the sort of basic sleep, diet, sport and exercise. Please don't laugh, BFC, that is Burnley Football Club, they're the most important institution in the world. Music, 
creativity, curiosity. And right at the top, if you'd have asked me the day before I met Janine Austin, and she told me about the jam jar, if you'd have said to me, how do you kind of keep okay with all this stuff? I'd have said, oh, well, I take medication, I've got a psychiatrist. That's what I would have said. And actually, I didn't even think of them until the end. So my jam jar has really helped me. And all I'm saying to you tonight, to you, Australia as a country, be the country that takes the lead on this. And to you as individuals, during the time that they're not taking the lead on it, get yourself your own jam jar. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, Bev. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, it has to be said, it is the strangest looking jam jar I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> but well, we you believe were, you. You were the, one of the ones who had the dirty thought, yeah? <laughs> I see. Fabulous talk and really has been a, a wonderful scene setter. So let's get our, the rest of our panel up as we move into this discussion. And of course, a little later on, we'll take questions from all of you here tonight. Joining Alistair is former Australian of the Year, Professor Patrick McGorry. He's the Executive Director of Origin, Professor of Youth Mental Health at the University of Melbourne. He's also a founding director of Headspace, and you well know that his groundbreaking work with early psychosis and young mental health patients has been extremely important. Christopher Pine, he's still making headlines to this day. <laughs> <laughs> He can't stay away. I think he was the only federal politician that invoked both tears of laughter and joy and sadness, deep sadness when he left from both sides of the house after 25 years in politics. He was a backroom dealer, as we know, a front bench performer in many portfolios, including science, industry, defense. And uh, as uh, Alistair mentioned, it was one of the forces behind the establishment of Headspace. So lovely to have you with us. And Thank finally, you. Dean Madigan, a social marketing and political campaigning guru. <laughs> She's worked on 11 election campaigns and Mental health, though, is also close to home for her. Her younger sister was diagnosed with schizophrenia at 19. Her older sister is a social worker who specializes in mental health. And her campaign, her ad campaign, No One Deserves a Serve to Stop the Abuse of Retail Staff, won widespread industry recognition. So, Dee, thank you so much for joining us. Um, a terrific panel that we have assembled. Pat, let's start with you, because it's good for us to get a sense of where we are in terms of the scale of the problem right now. So what is it? Um, well, I think, alluding to what Alison just said, I don't think any politician in the world has really understood the scale of the problem, the scale of the issue. Um, from, I just, just sitting in this room tonight, I remember when we were here 15 years ago, there were 800 people in this room. In, in 2004, I was telling Chris, he didn't, wasn't aware of that background, but. We had 800 people basically saying we want something done about youth mental health. And that was in the lead up to a federal election in, in, uh, following which Christopher became parliamentary secretary for, for mental health and Headspace came out of that. So I think people power that. So the reason I'm saying this is that I, I think we've made progress in some areas. I, oh, I call them oases of progress, they're oases. Mm -hmm. But outside of that is a desert and we have not actually if you look at the world, global mental health, Lancet published a uh, whole issue last October, which was la launched in London at, uh, on, on World Mental Health Day. Health ministers from all over the world were there. And it said that we've made zero progress around the world in mental health in the last 10 years. We spend 2% of the health budget on, on something that's actually the number one health problem in the world economically and in human terms. And why has it become the number one problem? What are, what are the factors that are driving that? Well, you know, be, if you look at the burden of disease, infectious diseases <clears throat> have been defeated largely in, in, in uh, high-income countries. They're on, the, they're on the 
decline in middle-income countries and mental illness is coming to the foreground. It's, it's probably increasing in, 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 in uh, prevalence and, and as well, in, but it's, it's just the other issues are being dealt with. Alistair has given the example of cancer. Cancer is actually, you know, um, really being managed in a much better way because of prevention, because of early intervention, because of sustained care when, uh, once people are diagnosed. We don't do any of those things in mental health, not, not one of them. Mm. So how do we expect it, it to be reducing? It, it's not. So it's a massive problem. It's much more important than things like the NDIS, although that was something that was very good that was done in this country. But 400,000 people uh, are involved in that scheme, $22 billion a year being spent on it, spending $9 billion on 4 million people with mental illness. So that mismatch is dramatic. It means that only about a third to a half of people get any type of mental health care, and the quality of that care is way below the quality of what people get with physical health care. So that's the situation. On the other hand, Australia is the country that, as Alistair is alluding to, that can deal with this because we are the most innovative country in the world when it comes to developing approaches to mental health. And our research is it's ranked fifth in the world in mental, in mental health. It's ranked 11th or 12th in the world in cancer. So we've got the talent, we've got the innovation. We're just not backing it. So Christopher Pine, you've been close to the inner sanctum. We could spend all night talking to you about some of those cabinet dealings. Why, when you hear Pat characterise it in this way, the extent of the problem, why are politicians not getting the message? Well, of course, in uh, life and in politics, the squeaky wheel gets the most oil. And for decades, people with mental illness or their families have covered up rather than confront uh, what is obviously a, a real illness, uh, just like a physical illness, and so there, isn't, there hasn't been until recently, really until the last 10 years, a foundation of people who are pressing forward on behalf of mental health. That's why forums like tonight and last night in Sydney, the work that Pat's done, the fact that he was Australian of the Year, the work that Alastair's doing travelling around the world speaking about mental health, is important in terms of, as he says, it's talk, it's the conversation which can be, can, can be annoying but we need to have that foundation to shift the debate amongst politicians, media people, industry leaders to the idea that there needs to be an enormous investment in mental health because cancer or leukaemia or infectious diseases, there was not the stigma like there is now about mental health. There wasn't the stigma to the same extent and people were prepared to talk about it. But when you had a mental illness in the 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s, <coughs> You know, or even the 80s and into the 90s, your family didn't want anyone to know about it. And that's why they were shut away in places like the Glenside Medical Facility in Adelaide. Nobody even knew who was there. So, Alistair, do you buy that theory that people haven't been talking about it, they haven't been knocking on their politician's door and saying we need more support, we need more services? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, Chris was right. Most People have such a negative view of politicians, but actually most politicians do want to do the right thing. They do want to respond to people's needs and desires, but they are under massive pressure to do everything for everything, and you can't. So that means that because there are all these different competing forces trying to get their attention, trying to get resources, they, they will go where the noise is. <laughs> so you have to make the noise. And so if I think about, you know, if you're a health minister now, and times are money's tight and times are hard and you've got to make some cuts and you've got a little pen there and you've got to say right well can I cut cancer can I cut children's services or can I cut mental health oh I know I'll do mental health because nobody's going to squeal and nobody's going to shout and you've got to squeal and you've got to shout and Dee you've seen that in your political life that you'll be on a campaign trail and an issue will get so much traction that politicians are forced to attend to it even on the campaign trail yeah, but I think part of the problem now with mental illness, and I think you alluded to it, is the awareness is right up there. The awareness yeah. campaign has worked. To, not, you know, brilliantly, but it's there. Everyone's aware of it. Every time you pick up a woman's day, there's a footballer with depression or whatever. But, but politicians need more than awareness. They want 
a solution. They mm. want to buy into something. So we've sold the awareness, but what we haven't done is sold the solution. And it's such a tricky solution to sell because it's such a broad spectrum of illnesses and such a broad spectrum of treatments. But I think that we need to start breaking it down and um, um, PRing the wins so, so people can see that there are cures to bits of mental illness. There are treatments that change lives. So only then will politicians think, well, the funding's not just going to go into some sort of hole that will just trickle down and nothing will come from it because politicians like wins. You know, they, they want to look good. And so selling the solution is, is I, th mm. I think, the part that we're missing at the moment. Mm. And, and, Pat, to, your, to that point... Um, this concept of, as Alistair put it, as mental health, a, a whole picture of how a human is, physical and mental health, mm. is that part of the problem in the way we are putting this, this bundle together? Um, <clears throat> I think what Dee said is absolutely right, and that's been our experience, hasn't it, mm. Chris? Because we didn't try to do, a, 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 we're going to fix this problem in one big monolithic thing. We said, here's a solution with, with Headspace. Mm. We said, here's a solution with early intervention for psychosis. We can do that in several other areas. We've got a lot of evidence-based platforms and models. We've, we've designed one for the Victorian government in, in, in relation to the Royal Commission. We do have solutions. And we've got to do them in a stepwise way. You know, and and that, that will success breeds success. And, and you've got to show that things work. Because if you keep saying, this is an impossible, wicked problem, everyone gets deflated and disempowered. No one thinks you can do anything about it, so they move on to the next thing. Mm, they you've move got on to something they can fix. Yeah. <laughs> and whereas we can yeah. fix this. Mm. They absolutely can fix this. But there's got to be consensus about the sequence of things that you do. I, I just want to say one other thing. You mentioned Sorry. cuts. Mm. Someone mentioned cuts. You wouldn't believe it. But we've got a Royal Commission in Victoria which is hearing horror stories every single day. The last couple of days has been about suicide. And the hospital networks in Victoria, despite having been given more money for mental health care by the government to improve or to shore things up until the Royal Commission comes up with a solution, are now cutting mental health services as we speak. That is just unbelievable that that can actually happen in this climate. I was going to say that I think, you know, running a campaign like this is like a poacher in their pheasant. You, know, you have to get the politicians to think that this is their own yep. decision, their own plan, and slowly bring them in. So the, what we did with Headspace was I thought we needed to get the government onto the sticky paper. And when they see that there can be a win with a certain <coughs> amount of money, they're not going to reverse it to start with. And then you bring them that little bit further along until the poachers got their pheasant. And we, we haven't got the pheasant yet. We're sort of on the way. Well, as the We've got the headspace. Origin's now being properly funded. They've got better buildings. But we've got a long way to go to make sure that mental health's treated the same way as, say, cancer. But it's about making the politicians feel that they're moving along slowly. You get them to where they can't reverse out of it. And then you close the door behind them and say, right, now we've got to get the money. When, when, you, when I talked about the mill thing and the ark, and I was talking about, you know, when does the change come? The change comes in lots of different bits and things happen and, 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 and we, we change the way we think about things. And then there does come the tipping point. And I think we're, I, th I get the feeling we're not that far. No. Mm. And that's why I say, I think if mm. one country mm. could show the rest of the world, <clears throat> we've reached our tipping point and this is what it looks like. And we're healthier and we're happier and we're more productive and we're saving money other countries are going to say, wow, that's really interesting. And then they go, so let's say the Australian government did that, like the Irish smoking thing, when Tony Blair could stand up and say, and so, you know, I can today announce we're going to be banning smoking, because he then had the confidence to do that, and as Chris says, that's now our idea. We're doing that. We're making that change. So, you know, <laughs> you've got to... health's very costly to the economy. All those exactly. days lost in Absolutely. jobs in well, the that's work why the Product place. Commission thing is so good. And hopefully they'll come up with you know, solutions as well as yeah. telling us what the real cost is. But the, the problem is, though, because it was hidden under a carpet for so long, we don't have the numbers. Like with mm. smoking, we could say this many people died of mm. cancer. With, with mental health, things like suicides were covered up. Um, lost productivity days were covered up with other excuses. So we actually don't have the numbers that we probably need yeah. to have to make our case you know, as well as it yeah. needs to be made. The, me the media were told not to report suicide, and we as mental health professionals keep telling them not to report it yeah. because we're scared about copycat. Mm -hmm. We can manage the copycat issue. We've got to t you're not going to do anything about a problem you don't know about, as you say. Yeah.
So, Christopher, to that point, though, in terms of capturing your politician and locking the gate and forcing him into a position... <laughs> with his to, pheasant. With his pheasant. With no, his he pheasant. is the pheasant. Oh, he's the pheasant. He's the pheasant. He's the pheasant. He's the pheasant. <laughs> he's the pheasant. <laughs> We're the poacher. We're the poacher. He's the pheasant. The Liberal yeah. Party have pheasants. We've just got chickens. Yeah. <laughs> 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 got, I thought you were going to pigeons. say vegans. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, no, that's the greens. <laughs> that's the greens. We haven't got a green I've now become the poacher turned gamekeeper, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have, and you should be doing a better job on this front, not going off to some defence industry. <laughs> um, ooh. 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 <laughs> Topical and controversial. I know. No, you can do whatever you like. You've been cleared, haven't you? I this have. Is, you have. Entirely. More seriously, though, Chris, <laughs> um, to the point that Alistair was making earlier about the political climate, and it is a concern for a lot of people, because there is the sense that more conservative political climate that we are dealing with with Trump and Johnson and now w with your side of politics that has, we all know, been captured by the far right for, for a good number of years. How seriously do you think conservative polit politicians take this issue? Well, I think there's two answers to that. I'd be interested in what other people say about that. But I think Alastair, in his presentation, made an extremely valuable point about the conservative side of politics when it comes to mental health. You can sell it as a saving to the economy and to the health budget. If you get mental health right, you won't be filling up your emergency departments with people who are having a psychotic episode. Workers will be more productive. Uh, there'll be a lot less people being prescribed uh, drugs by the, the, the health service. So from an economic point of view, it can be sold to, and I, I don't accept that the conservatives don't care about no. people's lives, of course, but I understand the point you're making, but I think you can sell it economically. Secondly, conservative politicians need to have something that is outside what they're supposed to be interested in. Every non-Labour politician needs to have a cause that they can say to their electorate, I'm not just a bean counter, I'm not a, an accountant in government, I'm really passionate about mental health or homelessness or indigenous disadvantage at the, in the APY lands, whatever it might be, because it softens their image. So actually conservative politicians are a very good target and in mm. fact, it was Andrew Robb, of all politicians, who was the first one mm. to be very public about, about his, his battle with illness. depression. Exactly. Mm. And that's mm. true. The personal experience, Alistair, like you have been prepared to do and then work closely with a politician, um, do you think the personal experience is where we can change this? Uh, it's very important. Because, look, we, we all live our lives through stories. You know, why do we watch films? Why do we rather watch a film about something than than kind of, I don't know, go around a museum or we live through stories. And, and the stigma, what's really interesting about this for politicians, so I talked about Jeff Gallup last night. We had the debate in the British Parliament a while back on, on mental health. And I worked out of our 650 MPs, only six have actually talked about having had some sort of mental health challenge themselves. Well, listen, Chris and I both know it's a lot higher than one in 100. Mm. And yet, they, for reasons I understand, to do with the stigma, to do with their opponents exploiting it, the media, what their constituents will think, they don't want to be open. But what I feel we have to do is at some point, all of us kind of make a leap that says we can be as open about our mental health as we are about our physical health. Mm. I think then we're fine. That's when you get parity. Because, of course, politicians learn from what they see. They're like you know, a child that touches a hot iron. They are unlikely to touch the second time. <laughs> but when Michael Dukakis's wife, Kitty Dukakis, had to admit that she'd had a mental um, illness and had been treated, his campaign was dead in the water. Mm. His opponents smashed him. Mm. When James Eagleton had to admit to having electric shock therapy in the yes. 1970s, he was dropped from the ticket. Exactly. So politicians until recently yeah. have had the example of never admitting yeah. to not being in perfect health. Not even yeah. to their own party or they'd be worried about pre-selection. Correct, exactly. So, so, Dee, let's talk about if you were, if you were shaping a campaign to, to collectively pull, as you point out, very fractured issues together, what would you be driving? What would be the driver? Well, I actually probably wouldn't pull them together. <laughs> um, I, I, I would pull them apart. And we, we've seen that with cancers. 
you know, they're being pulled apart. And, and it's bad in some ways because you have competing charities and competing foundations and whatever. But we know that some are done better than others. Now, there's a whole lot of reasons for that. And I think it goes a little bit into the mental health space is that the cancers where you are seen as um, um, contributing to it get far less funding than those where you are seen as being an innocent victim of it. And I suspect a little bit of that plays in when it comes to mental health, that there is that bit of like, well, I've, I've had a little bit of depression and I was okay, so why does this person need more than that? So I think there is a little bit of blame apportioned there, but I would nonetheless break it up, only because it is so vast and if you need to sell wins, if you need to sell solutions, you have to kind of pick a couple of sexy ones to at least start mm. it going. And I know that's an awful thing to say and it means some things will miss out at the beginning while others will get more funding. But if I was doing the campaign, that's what I would do. Can I, I just ask you, Dee, um, because I've often thought when you were on the Gruen transfer that you could, if you people could turn your minds to selling this, it would be just brilliant for us. To selling but something good instead of cornflakes. Yeah, Gosh, yeah, well, harsh, no, no. Harsh, <laughs> look, look, you, you know that, um, that segment where, where yeah, you were the asked... Pitch. The, the pitch. Yes. Yeah, the pitch, yeah. I thought about that. But what you just said, cancer... I think the reason cancer gets so massive, massive support is two things. One is that the, the hope, there's yeah. hope held out. No one says you're never going to get better. People in psychiatry used to tell patients, if you've got schizophrenia, you will never get better. Mm. That was just a massively negative thing to say and wrong. But so hope is one thing and then fear is the other. Everyone's afraid of dying, right? So they're naturally going to support cancer. So people should be afraid of dying because of mental illness if, yes. if, this, if the treatment is not there. So. Is it's, that a way forward? Yes, of course. It's, it's any, any good social marketing campaign has two elements. It has the carrot, which is, you know, you're not going to die as young, and it has the stick as well. And those two, the, the, it is the hope and the fear. <coughs> I mean, and political campaigns are the same, although we go 90% fear, because it works. Um, but, yeah, you need a little bit of hope and you need a little bit of fear, but you need some, you need some good news, some stories. Like, cancer's very good at... And I know friends of mine who are scientists get really cross when things go in the papers, you know, that they've found a cure for some sort of cancer, and they haven't, usually. It's actually mostly... Except in it's mice, just, in mice. Yeah, have. in mice, and, you know, 57 million years' time, they'll be able to recreate that in humans. But that PR matters because politicians <laughs> read it because voters read it. So that's the kind of thing that I think the mental illness industry needs to get better at selling itself. And, and to that point, and to all of you here in your experience, is the medical profession fighting itself? We've seen just recently a lot of natural therapies being struck off. You can't, you can't claim them on your private health care anymore. Now, these are things that potentially can contribute to your whole of health. Is the, mental, uh, is the medical profession fighting itself in terms of resources? And is that a problem? Well, Yes is the short answer because they're all operating in such kind of competitive environments for resources. And I, th I think that, you know, so Dee's absolutely right about, I mean, I, I don't know whether I agree about the kind of separating thing. I think you need a big message and then you also need the, the things there. But I think within, <coughs> the, within the medical profession, you know, the cancer specialist, it's not that they don't want mental health to be properly supported but they don't want it to be properly supported if it means it's at their expense and I think the other thing with the, with the medical profession, I think we overestimate listen, GPs are great I think we overestimate how little, certain, I don't may, may, I hope it's better here, but in the UK an awful lot of GPs actually aren't that good on mental health um, and, and, the, and, and they you know, I think we have to have far better training for, G for GPs of the... Psychiatry is seen as a kind of separate thing. And it's also, it's very low down the ranking. Somebody sent me this amazing paper. It's incredible what PhD students do. It, the headline was, Disease Prestige Rankings Around the World. Disease <laughs> <laughs> Prestige, Disease prestige. prestige. <laughs> And what he'd done, this guy, he'd gone around the world and asked medical students and doctors all around the world to rank how they saw disease. Number one was myocardial infarction, which I presume is heart attack. Heart attack. Yeah. The bottom five were all mental health conditions. That's how they see it. So that's why the mental health sector does have to fight that. You do have to compete for the space and the resources. Mm -hmm. We found uh, back in 2004-05 uh, when Pat and I were putting together the mental health package that the Howard government uh, created in 2007 
that one of the reasons that the GPs didn't spend a lot of time, didn't, didn't do mental health as well as they do now, was because it's very time consuming. Yeah. So someone comes in and the GP has to ask them a lot of questions to tease out that they've actually got depression or mm. a, a, a mental health issue. And our system has worked on the basis of the number of visits that you have yeah. and the number of people you see is how much you get paid. And of course, GPs and aren't only interested in money, but they still have to run their practices. So yeah. mental health <laughs> patients take a long time. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we did in that package was actually pay GPs longer to see, more, to see patients for longer uh, with the mental health packages that they put together, the plans. Mm -hmm. And we extended Medicare to psychologists and said people could see them 12 times a year for free because the other problem with mental health patients is they're usually homelessness or they haven't got a job. So as soon as they can't pay to see their psychologist or their doctor, they don't go anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So how are they going to get any better? So, so, so I think that the, the federal government has actually made some improvements at the front end. You know? So it's, it's, it's actually not that hard up to a point to get entry level care for the mild problems. But you know, that's about maybe 10 or 11% of the, of the 20% or so that, that have mental ill health in any given year. Then you've got another 8% that have got moderately severe problems and they need specialist care, team-based care. And then you've got the 3% with serious mental illness that need you know, very intensive and acute care. In Victoria, 1%, 1.1% 1 .1 of, of those 3% get acute care. So your missing middle, as we call it, is, is, is well over 10% of the population. And these people are marooned, you know, in no man's land. Yeah. They're too sick for, for primary care and they're not life-threatening enough to get to force their way into the public hospital system. Yeah. That's the situation. We call it the missing middle. It's resonating around Australia, that term. That is the group that, that governments have to respond to. And just one point about GPs. I think time is one thing. They need more time. But I think all doctors, you know, and I include psychiatrists in this, we're hearing this in the commission. We've got to show more humanity and care for patients. They've got to feel that doctors really care about them. That's a skill, it's a gift, it can be, it's very high premium for patients. If you talk to patients, that's the one thing they remember, you know, what, how they felt with, with, the, with the professional, not the technical aspect. You want the technical aspect to be right too, but that is very, very important in psychiatry and mental health. Uh, Christopher Pine, one word answer. Is Scott Morrison the kind of Prime Minister who could seize this tipping point? <coughs> Well, he's extremely confident. That's a no. That's one word. <laughs> That's he's definitely a no. He's won the election, and I think his commitment on suicide... I'm going to say we lost the election, but... His commitment <laughs> on suicide is very genuine, mm -hmm. and what we have to do with him is move that from suicide, which is the final disastrous act in mental health, to homelessness, relationship breakdown, making oh, sure everyone has a job, can feed themselves, all those things and then I, that would be a good outcome. So yes, I, by the way, I, I think it's a good start. I don't know Scott Morrison, but I did see uh, Dan Andrews today, and I really thought he got this. I really did. No, I think he, he yeah. gets that enough. Yeah. All I right, what a wonderful panel. Please thank them, Patrick McGorry, <laughs> Christopher Pine, Dean Madigan, and Alistair Campbell. Thank and thanks to all of you for coming along.